Welcome to our review of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, a deck builder that brings some new twists and classic anime IP to the genre. One thing before we get going, a big thanks to Japanime Games for providing us with a review copy of this card game. Yeah, thanks a lot for that one, actually. Uh, Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade was designed by Johan Benvenuto and Florian Syriax and features licensed artwork from the anime. It was published in 2019 as a joint effort between Don't Panic Games and Japanime Games. This deck-building card game with, a, with board game elements plays one to four players with games lasting up to 90 minutes. It features a low, MSRP of only $59.95, which is a steal for what you actually get in the box. Mm -hmm. so Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade is a competitive deck building game where players take on the roles of bounty hunters Spike, Edward, Jet, and or Faith, the main characters from the show. These space cowboys will be traveling between their ship, the Bebop, and three planets trying to earn bounties on criminals. This is done through a deck building system with four resources, one of which carries over round to round. Win two different ways to take your targets down by fighting them head on and risking filling your deck with wound cards or investigating them, which is harder but less risky. A variable card market and a thematic semi co-op system where you can use special abilities of other characters, whether they like it or not, are great ways to tie in the theme. This theme is reinforced through a space-based like card combo system and the climax of the game, which features a final hunt for Vicious himself. One of the things that really stands out about this game is the component quality, which mm -hmm. you can check out in our Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade unboxing video on YouTube. Inside the box, you'll find both miniatures and standees for the characters, a molded plastic box insert, dual layer player and planet boards, a stand to hold and display bounty cards, counters, cubes, and of course, cards. Lots and lots of cards. These cards are of excellent quality and feature very clear layout and iconography, as well as plenty of text when needed. The rule book is honestly fantastic. Uh, this includes a one page description of deck building that is super well written to the extent I think every deck builder, every publisher should have a copy of this page in it that just teaches you the basics of how deck building works. Well, now that we know what you get with this anime themed game, let's dive in to how to play. So Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade starts with everyone picking a character to play and taking their starter deck, which includes four unique cards for that character and six standard for a few Wulongs cards. They place a cube on the one spot on their fuel marker, shuffle their deck and draw five cards. Their mini is placed on the Bebop, which is placed in the center of the table, along with the three planets, each with a cube on the one spot of their movement gauge. That's the movement gauge on the planets. Interestingly, miniatures for any character not being played are also placed mm -hmm. on the Bebop. These are non-player characters that can be affected by some card play. Additionally, players can use non-player characters' abilities when at the same location as them. Now the market cards are shuffled and placed on their little cardboard holder and an initial market of five cards is revealed. The moon deck is shuffled and placed on its cardboard holder. Next, the big shot bounty deck is created. This is the most complicated part of setup, which involves splitting the cards by planet, finding ones worth zero points, placing one bounty on each player board, removing some cards based on the player count and seeding the vicious card in the bottom of the deck, which is then placed on the bounty board. Sorry, Sean said player board. That was supposed to be planet board. That was my mistake in the notes. You're placing one bounty on each planet. So there's someone to hunt down on each of the planets. Finally, tokens are placed on these bounties that are on the planets. Now, these are two stacks of tokens for each bounty, and the number of tokens to place is indicated on the bounty card. Now, play begins with the jazziest player. Or a grab chwazi. Each turn, players take any of five actions any number of times in whatever order they wish. They can play a card from their hand. But most cards provide one or more of, more of four resources, with many cards also having additional abilities mm -hmm. as well. Now, some cards also have a team effect combo ability when that, uh, that goes off when the card is played after a previously played card that matches the color of the combo section of the card. Think Star Realms. The resources you can gather in this game are fuel, which carries over from turn to turn and is used to move around the boards as well as activate special abilities. 
Wulongs, which are used to purchase new cards from the market. Strength, which is used to engage a bounty in physical combat. And Clues, which are used to investigate a bounty. Now, the order you play your cards in is very important when playing mm -hmm. Cowboy Space Be uh, Bebop Space Serenade, as you fully resolve each card one at a time when played, and other actions can be taken between playing cards. Now, players can spend fuel to move between the Bebop and the three planets. The cost to move to the Bebop is always one, but the cost to travel to a planet can change based on the card play and other in-game events. Purchasing cards can be done at any time during your team turn using any Wulong you have earned on the cards you have already played this turn. Now, each player has two unique abilities, one primary and one secondary, each which takes fuel to trigger. On your turn, you can use your own abilities or the primary abilities of any character in the same location with. Note this could be another player or a non-player character. Each of the four characters features totally different unique abilities. Now, Spike helps you cycle your deck and can buy cards from the market at a discount and place them on top of his deck. Ed can draw a card from their discard pile and lets everyone buy clues for fuel. When you are with Faye, you can convert fuel to Wulongs and she can purchase cards from the market using fuel. Finally, Jet offers a way for players to remove wound cards from their hand and discard pile while being able to engage in physical combat with bounties without taking wounds himself. Now, the last action option is to confront a criminal on the same planet as your character. Spend strength to engage in physical combat or clues to investigate that criminal. With physical combat, you remove and keep one resistance token from the bounty card, but you also draw a wound card. When you spend clues, you keep a investigation token instead with no penalty. A criminal is captured the instant either of their two token piles is empty. The player who got the final shot in claims the bounty card, and then everyone earns one point per counter they have, returning them to the pool. Everyone moves back to the Bebop, and, move, and the movement gauge for that planet is reset to one. Now after a capture, two new bounty cards are drawn from the Big Shot stand. If the planet showing on the new bounty is open, the card's placed there, and that's now the new criminal that's on that planet, and two new stacks of counters are put on top based on the numbers on the card. Now, if the card drawn shows a planet that already has an active bounty on it, the card is discarded and the movement gauge on the planet increases by one. Now, if any of these gauges ever gets past three, the criminal on that planet escapes. Their card is discarded and any tokens from that planet are returned to the pool with no one gaining points for them. The game continues like this, going around the table with players buying cards, moving between planets, investigating and battling criminals and claiming bounties, until the vicious card is drawn from the bounty deck. At this point, you enter the end game, where the game shifts to being a race to capture vicious. The discarded bounty cards become a vicious movement deck and, the, and an end game timer. Vicious tokens are stacked based on the player count, and note these are much higher than any of the other criminals you face so far. The game continues as before. Players take the same actions and can even continue to confront any remaining criminals in play. The only change is that a player on the same planet as Vicious can confront him. If you <laughs> confront him physically, you will take two wound cards for every resistance token you claim. In addition, any turn that Vicious loses a resistance token, he may move to a new planet at the end of that turn. Now, using clues and taking investigation tokens also works on Vicious, though he does take three clues just to take one token. Now, unlike taking a resistance token, when you investigate him, he doesn't move. He doesn't know you're after him and stays put. If anyone ends up drawing the last card of the bounty deck, everyone gets one more turn. And at the end of that round, Vicious escapes and everyone returns all of their Vicious tokens, scoring nothing for them. Now, the game continues until a player caps their Vicious with everyone scoring points for the token they collected and the final blow getting his Vicious card, which is worth two points or he escapes. Players then total up their points, which include points gained for collecting bounty tokens and any points on the bounty cards they collected. At that point, the player with the most points wins, with ties going to the player who collected the most individual bounty cards. Note, even if Vicious escapes, a winner is still declared, but that's a pretty lame victory and you should try again. Note, that's from the rule book, not necessarily our suggestion. Now, these are the rules for playing with two or more players. The game also includes a solo mode. When playing solo, you create the bounty deck as if you're playing a three-player game. 
Then while playing, any time you have to reshuffle your deck, which happens a lot, you reveal a new criminal card from the deck and discard it. This is in addition to drawing two cards when you claim a bounty in the normal way that the bounty's refreshed. The rest of the main game plays pretty much the same as with playing with more players. Once you reveal Vicious, you give him the capture tokens for four players, and you build his movement deck out of any remaining cards on the Big Shot stand, and all discarded cards. When playing solo, Vicious moves at the end of every turn, but you stop revealing cards whenever you shuffle your deck. Now, if Vicious escapes in this case, you lose. Otherwise, calculate your final score, and there's even a spot in the rule book to note these scores down, what character you played, and what your total was. All right, well, that's enough of an overview of play. For a more detailed gameplay description, check out Mo's written review on the blog. And let's move on to answering the question, who should pick up this game? All right, let me start by saying, uh, like full disclosure here, this was a review copy, which we already disclosed, but I'm a big fan of deck building card games. And I'm a big fan of Cowboy Bebop. So this had me jumping at a chance to review this one. So who is this? I'm like, oh, I want to try that. A Cowboy Bebop deck builder, I need to do it. What followed, though, after that were a number of pleasant surprises. Now, the first came when I was unboxing it, and you can actually watch it live, where I was just blown away by the quality of what you get in this box. Like dual layer player boards, miniatures, an awesome box insert that literally has a place for everything that fits perfectly and nothing shakes around. If you watch the video, I actually make the assumption that this must be a Kickstarter. This has got to be stretch goals that are in here. These are the kind of things that are usually stretch goals during a crowdfunding campaign. And to reinforce that hunch, the game includes cardboard standees in addition to the miniatures, which just seems really odd if it's not an upgrade. I honestly think there were plans to crowdfund this game and that these some of these things were upgrades and unlockables they expected to hit. But there's somewhere along the line, I don't know if it was at Japanime Games or what, they went, you know what, just publish it. Let's put it out there. This really does feel like a fully blinged out, deluxified, all-in pledge with all the pizzazz that comes in each copy. And yet you're not paying, you're, you're paying, you know, Kickstarter advanced copy prices. Uh, yeah. It's not the 70 or $80 retail version of a Kickstarter deluxe game. Uh, it's really shocking what you're getting in here. Uh, it, you know, it, it could easily just be a simple deck builder, mm -hmm. but they've given you so much more that really does make a difference to play. Um, yeah. even if you don't necessarily, you know, the, the difference between standees and miniatures arguably is, is very little in the way of gameplay, mm -hmm. but other than that, all the other components really do enhance yes. the gameplay. Like even the box insert is meant to hold the tokens for you until you need them. Yeah. Like it's, it's a resource tray as well as a box insert. Though I'll admit we still use my wooden bowls cause I like my wooden bowls, but it does have a, like a trough areas in there. Now, the next surprise to me was the number of ways this game deviates from standard deck builders, the number of new elements and like just tweaked things that were done a little bit different that are in this game. Uh, one of these is the wound deck. While I have played multiple deck building games going back to Dominion that have punitive cards, right? Cards that clog up your deck and they stink getting. I haven't played one where those cards are different. They're randomized, right? They come from a deck and have different effects. Like here, you're going to find wounds that go, when you get a wound, it's going to go on top of your deck. Another one will go in your discard. Another one goes, I don't know if there's one that goes in your hand, but like they play different things. And then the way you get rid of them is all different. Like some you have to pay Wulongs to get rid of. Other ones might take fuel. Some you don't even put in your deck at all. You just lose two fuel and discard it. And then there's, there's another one that does nothing. Like if you're lucky, you can get the near miss card and not nothing. It was a near miss. You don't even take a wound. Yeah, this, this was a real... Shocker. I mean, we're all used to clogging up our deck, uh, but the fact that it's not a face up deck, oh, take the wound and put the wound mm -hmm. in your, you know, it's the take cards. A, yeah, take, take a, you know, take a card off that deck and figure out what happens. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't, and it also affects how much you can plan ahead because if you're taking, doing an attack before you're done your turn, because this game is very important in what order things are done. Mm -hmm. You may lose the ability to wrap up, to do your final actions if all yes. of a sudden you pull a wound that wipes out the last of the fuel that you had planned on using later in your turn. Uh, which, so, is yet, which is then another aspect about that timing mechanism too, right? Like uh, your first game, you're going to mess this up. Probably your fourth game, you might mess it up. And eventually you learn, you're like, wait, I got to time this 
So the last thing I do on my turn is the physical attack because I'm going to take those wounds and I need to account for that because I had those turns where you're like, I'm going to fly here, do this thing, and I'm going to hit him. Then I'm going to fly over here and hit this and get two bounties this turn. Meanwhile, you hit the first guy, you lose all your fuel. Yep. Now, another welcome addition is the ability to spend resources to clear the marketplace. This is something I would love to see in more deck builders. Any player on their turn can spend two fuel between their actions to wipe the market. In addition to this, there's also a number of bounty cards that cause you to wipe the market as soon as they enter play. Now, one of the things to remember about this game is to watch for that. This is the most easy thing to miss while playing this game is you flip up a bounty that should have wiped the market and you missed it. So watch for that. This is fantastic, though, because it eliminates a common deck building problem for non-static markets where the market fills up with either cards no one can afford or cards no one wants. Yeah, no, this is fantastic. And it is an issue that the the detail on the on the new bounty card that tells you to wipe the deck is uh, it's not small, but it kind of fills it fits in with the card and it's easy to to sort of not pay attention yeah. to. Um, but yeah, and, and not only does it solve the problems that exist with static markets or, you know, that are sorry, not static market markets, but flexible markets that get clogged up, but it also forces you to worry about, again, mm -hmm. about turn order because you might be wanting to buy something, but if you kill somebody before you buy, there's a chance that when the, if a new guy comes out, it might wipe the deck and you might not yep. be able to buy that card that you've been planning since last turn to pick up. Uh, next, I have the combo system. Well, combo systems aren't new thing to deck building. Like I remember them first from Star Realm. Star Realm was the first to do it really well, where if you play a card of the same color, it keys off and it does extra stuff. But I like the way it's done here and the way it's tied into the theme. So all of the combos here require you to have cards from two different characters who are then thematically working together to produce the new effect. And you almost get a little bit of a story there. You're like, well, I'm going to get some th some some Wulongs, but if I bring Faye with me, I also get some fuel, right? Like there's a bit of that going on. And I just like that aspect of the game, which makes it feel like the Bebop team working together without the players physically working together. And on top of that, you get into some hilarious struggles, again, because of your turn order. If mm -hmm. you've got a blue card that uh combos with a red card and the but the red card also combos with the blue card you have to decide you have to pick which yep. order you, you're only going to get one of them you only uh you can't back you know can't backwards combo so you really need to focus and decide what order things are going to go mm -hmm. in and you're going to lose one of the combos out of it if you don't have enough cards to to make it happen uh and you really have to again thinking about that play order within your own turn. And this is something that, that people who have played a lot of deck builders struggle with. We are so used to playing our entire card hand down on the table to figure out what we got. That does not work in this game. You got to play them one at a time. And if you got to move planets between cards, you got to wait till you move. And there's even timing with that where you're like, well, I have a card that does a fuel and, and, and gives me a strength so I can attack. Well, you can't use that fuel to move to the planet to do the attack because you have to resolve the whole card. You don't get to move until you're done. This whole thematic element of reluctant cooperation between competing bounty hunters leads me to my favorite part of this game. And this is the whole thing with you're all playing different characters and you have miniatures, but you can move each other around. It tends to be Jet Black's cards that let you move players around and you have cards that are like move a non-player character, move a player character, move multiple characters. And then once you've moved them around, it's that ability to use other players' special abilities. And again, it's players or non-player characters. So even if you're playing solo, all four of the characters are in play. And you're going to try to use your deck to manipulate those characters so they're there when you need it. And while the thing is, the players playing those characters and their players may not want to help. You might be over about to take out Vicious and then another player then flies you over to their planet so they can use your ability to, you know, heal some cards. And you're like, but now I don't have enough fuel to get back. That's the kind of thing that happens in this game. And I've got to say, if you watch the anime, these are reluctant f cooperators. They, 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 they are all bounty hunters, each trying to get the bounty themselves. And yeah, they got to work together to do a few things, but they would much rather be the ones to climb the final glory. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's another one of those things where you need to pay attention because it's real easy to be staring down at your hand, trying to work out that turn order that's so important. 
and miss the fact that someone has just picked you up off one planet and put you onto another planet, which has completely destroyed the <laughs> turn you'd been building in your hand. Yep. Now, I also like the fact there's a twist at the end of this game. Like, there's something else. Like, there's a finale. There's a boss fight, I guess, is really what it is. I like the fact that it switches to focusing on capturing Vicious. And you actually feel the shift in the game. At that point, things feel more desperate. You feel like you don't have enough time. You're not going to get it done. You feel like you're in a race. But mechanically, the game actually stays the same. So the actual gameplay doesn't change, but just like the feeling around the table shifts. Yeah, because you know at least after a play or two that you can't just take pot shots at him and hope he'll hope to beat him. You have to determinedly attack or investigate him or he will leave and no one will get those bonus points. Yes. And honestly, there's the opposite strategy. If you know everyone else has a whole bunch of points on vicious, you want him to run away as quick as possible. So no one gets those points. Now, another really brilliant thing in this game is having a resource you can save. I have never played a deck builder where I have a resource I can carry over turn to turn. I love that. Another one is the fact that you have two ways to confront each criminal. Again, very thematic. You can go into physical combat or you can investigate them. And I even dig the fuel system from moving around the board and how, you know, I, I don't know what it's supposed to represent, but like this person becomes harder to find on the planet. So it takes more fuel to find them. They're going into hiding, you know, like there's little thematic things there. I dig those elements as well. Yeah, this game is really well thought through, not only from a pure deck builder, you know, uh, concept with just the mechanics. If you, if you take all the layers of paint off, it plays really well, but then add to it the fact that it is thematic. It yep. really does tell the story of Cowboy Bebop quite well. Yes. Now, my biggest surprise out of everything is why do I not hear anyone else saying these things? Why is no one talking about this game? Like, it seems like it completely slipped under the radar, which is a shame. Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade is one of the best deck building games I've ever played. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's there's no excuse for this game not being shouted about. Uh, and the only thing we can think of that sort of came up is that it may have been overshadowed by Dune and Arnak. But, yeah, but those came out a year later. Yeah, I thought I, that and then I looked into it. and I'm like, no, this came out 2019. Dune and Lost Ruins Arnak are 2020. Though I will admit that was all pandemic time. That was all COVID time. That was all lockdown. So it is possible that it got overlooked. Well, it also depends on, you know, where it got released. Did it get released That's true. and buried at this con that, you know, this game decided to take off on? And mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of little things that go into game release schedules that uh, apparently left this one in the dust. Yeah. I think one of the problems is when you look at it, it looks like another deck builder. You don't know that you're getting miniatures and double layer player boards and deluxe components by looking at the cover of the box. Like the back, you might see it. You don't know that there's four resources and one carries over, which has never been done before. You don't know that the punitive deck is randomized so that there's different effects for every player every time you hit. Well, it's not every time. There's repeats in it. Like, you don't know these things that deviate from the norm. And it's licensed, and people still have a bias against licensed games, which I think is justified being someone who grew up in the 80s. But people have that. And I personally think nowadays you need to toss that out because there's tons of great licensed games. But I think all of that is what really hurt this game is people didn't know to look deeper. They're like, oh, it's Spammy Games, another deck builder, probably plays like Tonto Kore, and it's Cowboy Biba. And that's not what this is. But it's also worth noting, you don't have to be a Bebop fan to enjoy this game. We played this game many times with their friends, Kat and Tori. And when they only know Cowboy Bebop by name. They know it's a classic anime. They didn't even know it was a show about bounty hunters in space. They had no clue what the actual like, premise of the show was. They just knew it was a classic anime and people dig the soundtrack. Yeah, it's unfortunate that there isn't a uh, good jazz listening uh, list that can, you know, as well. <laughs> a little QR code in the rule book to there you go. Spotify your jazz li jazz listening. Uh... I, I will admit you can find the Cowboy Bebop series soundtrack on Spotify, which is what we used the last time we played. So you, you got to say when watching it, you don't realize how many slow, mellow, kind of honky tonky songs are in that until you sit down and play it while you're playing the game. You're like, no, no, give me the, the upbeat songs. 
Now, if I had to find faults with this game, because I, I, I hate being all this positive, like there's got to be something wrong, right? Well, I'll start with building the bounty deck. Doing that during setup stinks. Like, like having to pull out all the zero point bounties, then sort them by planet, then randomize them. And you're randomizing two cards. Randomize the two cards, then put one of those on each of the planets. Then you got to take these cards and put them with the rest of the decks, but still split by planet. Then you shuffle those, and then you take out some cards based on how many players there are. And until you memorize it, that means looking up in the rule book and go, okay, wait a minute, it's three players. How many cards do we have to leave in? Okay, we got to leave four cards in, so I deal four cards. And then you've got the ones that are left. You put some in the box, then you shuffle all those together. And then even then, you got to take three cards off the bottom and shuffle in the vicious card and shuffle that together and put it there. All I can say is you get better at this the more games you play. And I found it once I realized how many cards there were and started doing it by I need to remove X cards, it became a lot easier. Like, I'll give you the secret right now. With four players, you remove one plan, one card. With three players, you remove two. And with two players, you remove three. Once you get that down, it's way easier than having to look up in the book. Go, okay, I have to keep four. Well, it's easier to remove two than to keep four type of thing. Yeah, and the only other thing I would say specifically regarding that deck is the two-player game length could be a little short for some people. Yeah. Uh, I, I find the three player game length of this game is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and four players, four players fine. Uh, there can be, it can go a little bit longer than the box says we noticed, yeah. but it doesn't really feel long. Uh, three player is fantastic. Two player plays a little bit short because of the way you're, you're crafting down the deck. And I would say actually the three player, I think is the sweet spot for gameplay as well, just because of that non-player character mechanic. And the fact there are cards that do things with non-player characters, the four players, there are no non-player characters. So that actually really devalues those cards. They just generate you Wulongs now. And that ability to move the non-player character, I think, is a good advantage. I would say this is best at three, but there's no problem at four. And two, like two, it played great. It was nice and quick. It was still enjoyable. Um, did you get a chance to try it solo? I didn't, no. No. So I will admit, I didn't try it solo. One of the things that turned me off the solo mode was it's just to beat your high score. Like there were no ranks to achieve. There was that I, at least if you're going to make me beat my whole, own score, give me a target so that I can fail it the first couple of times and be like, right. I need to get the 40 to do well. I'm like, I don't, wouldn't even know what a good score is in the game playing solo. So I will admit we did not try it solo. To me, I, I'm not a big fan of next, you know, just get a higher score. I would like yeah. a win or loss condition when it comes to solo play. Now, another thing I would have liked to have seen in this game is a symmetry in the initial player decks. When you first get this game and start playing, it looks like you have unique decks. But honestly, what it is, is you have four cards in your player color, which matters because those will combo off different cards later in the game. But those four cards are identical between all four players for what they do. Yeah, this is, it, I mean, it's... It's Again, nice. we're, you get a, you the, because of the combo, it's it, it's slightly asymmetrical, but not really. Yeah. Now, you do have unique player abilities. It is totally asymmetric. So, like, I'm just, you know, I love asymmetry. If I can squeeze more in there, just one card. Give me one card that fits the play style. Give 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 Spike a draw card. Give um give uh, Ed a way to generate clue. Give Faye a way to generate extra fuel. Like, just just something. Give um give uh what a jet black a, a remove a wound card in his deck instead of a special bit like just do that just one card out of all of them heck give you eleven cards at the start so you don't have that I there's another minor complaint that's a complaint about almost every deck builder ever made I hate the ten card starting deck where you draw five because you know what your first two hands are I don't like that I want I want like knowing uh, give me well, one more card you know what at the same time though you know but you don't know I mean. You there are no, once of times you've drawn your sudden, first five. Yes, but there's a lot of times where it's like you you draw that first five and it's like oh look, I'm spending on my first turn and I've got nothing to spend on my second turn. Yes, um, it, it's the the predetermined second hand that bothers me. Not, not that initial five. It's the I know what the next five are. Right. Once I've learned the cards in the deck, which honestly isn't hard when six of them are the same. <laughs> All right. Overall. Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade is a fantastic deck builder. Uh, it's honestly one of the best we've ever played. And that's coming from a group, Sean included, and the usual players I play with that love deck building mechanics and games that use them. I truly do not understand why more people aren't like, like hyping this game. There's just so much here we enjoyed. And it actually took some thinking to come up with things to complain about here. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. If you enjoy Cowboy Bebop and play hobby board games, you need to pick this game up. Yeah. If you play and enjoy deck building games, you need to pick this game up. If you're like us and enjoy both, this should be a no brainer. No, I agree. Unless you totally hate Cowboy Bebops or hate deck building. I know there are deck building haters out there. You really should find a way to at least try this game out. Find out if the local game store has a, a demo copy. Find a friend who's got a copy. See if there's a, a demo night or a local cafe you can play it. I can't think of many hobby board game groups that aren't going to find something to enjoy here. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a true hidden gem that just hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. And I hope this review helps more people discover this great game. And I hope people pick it up. And I hope Japan and game sees that. And I don't know, we get some kind of more content. I don't know what that's going to be. Like, we've got the main characters already. I don't know quite what you can do here, but I would love to see this game thrive. See ya, Space Cowboy. Well, that's it for our review of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, a deck builder where whatever happens, happens. Is there a licensed game out there that you love? Let us know about it in the comments. Now, before we go, I also invite you to check out my written review of Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, which will be posted over at tabletopbellhop.com. If you're listening to this on the podcast, it better be up there or else I'm slacking. Uh, this will feature pictures of this well-produced anime game and a more detailed description of play.